Hey, welcome back. Lecture 9.3. This one's sort of ambiguously titled Beyond Words. Um, we're just going to talk about language in a, in a sort of bigger picture, and I'm going to talk about a number of different um, issues uh, that are related to language and the way we process language and the power language can have, not just for conveying information, but also for supporting human connection. Uh, and so... Yeah, we're going to go all over the board a little bit here, but that's going to be part of the fun. So let's jump in here right away. Um, I wanted, wanted to kind of start here. So in the early lecture, I mentioned that, you know, human language communication is so much richer than anything we see with animals. And that's true. Um, although there also, I want to make a, the point now that there is some pretty impressive language capabilities in animals as well. And there's a really interesting sort of history of psychology around um, the attempt to communicate with, well, especially the, the critters you see here, chimpanzees and great apes. Um, and in fact, uh, Lauren Petito, who you see featured here, was a professor at the University of Toronto Scarborough for a period of time. A period after this, this picture is taken from a time when she was working as part of Project Nim. So this is a, a movie you can watch, uh, rent out, and it's... Um, maybe on Netflix or something. I don't know. I don't know where it lives nowadays. Um, but it tells you this historical story, which you would find interesting, I think, for two reasons. One, because it is all about the notion of, you know, how deeply and richly could, could an animal like a chimpanzee communicate, uh, especially if it was really brought up in an enriched way where it was taught things like sign language um, and, and, you know, where a lot of attention was paid to it in terms of social interactions and such. Uh, and so it's a fascinating story about that, but it's also a fascinating story about how psychology research was done in like the 1960s, 1970s kind of time period. Um, it's also kind of interesting and sad around the issue of animal research. Uh, so, you know, this movie really touches on a lot of things and I would recommend it to you. Now, as an extension of this, I'm not going to talk about the details of Project NIM, but it did kick off this notion of trying to teach various animals to communicate using sign language. And I want to just show you one example of that to have you think about something, perhaps the most famous example, who's a gorilla named Coco. Us a window just, into her life, her mind, oh, and sorry, her heart. Who is that? Think me there. Okay, that is you. Gorilla, animal, Coco love. Okay, that's very good. That is you. You are a lovely animal. They couldn't have known that their intimate friendship would shatter century-old stereotypes and change forever our outlook of both gorillas and ourselves. Coco has a, a very strong sense of self. She um, feels she's important. She's got a strong ego. She's playful, very, can be very silly. <laughs> a quick spin, a quick, a really quick spin, and then once you're good and dizzy, <laughs> send you off. She's got a good sense of humor. Oh, no! A monster! A monster coming to get the alligator! <laughs> she can be very stubborn, uh, very willful. Finish! You are not finished! <laughs> you are not... You are not finished! You didn't do the work, I asked. Please pick those up. Coco, you are very good at that. Please pick them up. On, Their relationship is like no other. Penny and Coco are the first human and gorilla to share a common language. Penny taught Coco to speak sign language. Play with them after you help. Okay? No, no, not fake. No. What? Their exchanges, their conversations were enchanting and quickly revealed the power language has to build a bridge between our species. Then you go and you bring those papers. 
Penny armed Coco with a powerful tool that allowed her to speak as an ambassador on behalf of her endangered species. <laughs> Astonishingly, Coco is willing to provide us a window into her life, her mind. Okay, so I'd love to play you a whole bunch of this, um, but what I'm just going to say is it's online. Um, check it out and and really kind of it's it's a great opportunity when you see some of these interactions with Coco to really think about you know how richly is she using language and you know how how close is the line potentially between humans and, and somebody like Coco and, and how far is, is that gap? Um, so it's a really interesting thought provoking kind of um, thing to check out. Um, and it gives you a good sense of how far research has come in, in terms of trying to see how close humans can come to having rich interactions with other species. So just a cool thing to check out. Okay. Moving on, because this is going to be a bit of, well, this is just more moving on. I'm not going to dwell on this in, in any means, but this is just one for you TikTok people out there. Um, apparently, there is um, this dog named Bunny, Bunny the dog, who uses one of these devices to communicate their her desires to her owner and um, she's apparently quite a star on TikTok. I've watched some of these I don't know if I'm that impressed but I thought I would just throw it out there as an example to you of of a dog trying to use expressive communication so I told you that they can understand a lot right um, that they have a good receptive communication but in the case of Bunny she's asking for things she's communicating things she wants now my dog does that all the time with her body language but bunny does it using one of these little pictographs where she can press certain buttons that that put together create sentences and so you can decide whether the sentences bunny makes make sense or not but hey yeah so something funny for you tiktok people um all right TikTok people. <laughs> this is, does that sound like an old guy talking? I don't know. I don't mean to. Um, this is some of this is going to sound like an old guy talking too, um, but in a way that I hope is informative. So this was an issue. You you may have known that I've often been asked to to kind of speak about things related to the COVID pandemic and the psychology of the COVID pandemic on television and such. And one of the issues we always talk about is how important social connection is during times of threat and times of stress. Um, and literally, you know, when we're feeling stressed and we're feeling threatened, uh, we reach out to our close social connections and we want to have this feeling that they're there and that they care. Uh, and so I want to relate this to language and the different ways of communicating. Uh, and so I'm going to suggest to you there's a real value in real time, preferably face to face, but, you know, maybe over over Zoom or something, but especially real time communications and especially real time face to face communications. Um, and so here's the story. Every time we communicate with one another, we're, we're doing communicating in two different sort of very different channels remember we've talked about the unconscious mind and the conscious mind all through this course um, at the conscious level frontal lobes we're really all about the words that we're expressing that message we're trying to put into words right and that's a critical part of our communication but in addition every there, there's all these other things about the way we express these words. I'm sort of accentuating this right now and, and a little bit intentionally, but I'm just almost trying to go with it a little bit where <laughs> I almost felt Italian there. Wow, amazing. Um, but no, where, you know, certain words you want to stress perhaps. And maybe you do that with eye contact. Maybe you do that by making a word a little bit louder, um, et cetera. All of these sorts of, of, of the, our language, of the way we express our communications that's where our emotion lives um, that's where the the potential for connection and human connection lives and it especially lives when it's a real-time communication so let me kind of contrast two situations and I'm going to start with the one I like so let's say I'm telling a story to a friend of mine but I'm telling that story on a telephone in real time Okay, so we don't even need face to face. Let's say we're on the phone and, and you know, like, like 
uh, Stranger Things, you know, when they sit and talked on the phone, they actually use their phone as phones. Imagine we're doing that. Um, and I'm saying to a friend of mine, and let, let's say it's during the pandemic, and I'm saying to a friend of mine, you know, I, I was walking along and um, I don't know, maybe I gave you this example before, but I'm going to use it again. That's how it works. I was walking along and I came across a group, a large group of people, and they were blocking the whole path and none of them were wearing masks. And I had to walk right through them to get where I was going. And it was extremely uncomfortable to have to go through all these people who were not wearing masks. If as I'm saying that, the person on the other end of the phone just says something like this, oh, or man, um, anything that kind of suggests they're with me. They were not just listening to my words, but they were living that experience with me. We only take the time to do that for people we actually care about. Most of the people we interact with, it's a surface level interaction. The people we really care about, we occasionally take the time to really listen to them. And I'm going to stress this from a different facet in a moment, but to really listen to them and, and to feel what they feel. That when they're telling us a story, we're living that story with them. And we show them that by doing those little emotional reactions in the right way at the right time. So we snicker when we're supposed to snicker. We gasp when we're supposed to gasp. We, we make sounds of disbelief oh, when we're supposed to make sounds of disbelief. We don't do this with conscious thought. This comes from our much more emotional center. And it tells that other person... I care about you. That's really important. So now imagine I'm doing the same thing, but I'm doing it with social media. And so I'm, I'm, I'm reaching out through a message of some sort um, to, a, to a friend of mine, and I'm saying that same story. You know what? I was going down a path, and there was this group of people, and blah, 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 blah. And I type that out, and I press send. Okay, and I wait. So first of all, what did I miss? Well, when I told the stories, there were no reactions to the stories. There may be a reaction after a while, but you know, it's that immediate reaction that tells me the person was listening and they were with me. And I'm, I'm not going to get that immediate reaction. That's only happens in real time. Uh, and so instead I get a delayed reaction. And of course there's that delayed reaction is just a bunch of letters. Well, not just a bunch of letters, a bunch of letters and some emojis. The emojis is, are the attempt of the person to express the emotional side of their reaction with a picture that their frontal lobes chooses. <laughs> their frontal lobes is not where the emotions come from or not where they should come from. They should come from the limbic system, the, the unconscious mind. That's where genuine, authentic emotional reactions come from. When they're filtered through the frontal lobes who chooses an emoji, they lose their authenticity. Um, and so, you know, that person may respond back. They may put the right emoji or whatever. You're not going to feel that social connection, that emotional connection. You're not going to feel so directly that that person is there and that they care. Okay. So one of my messages for you guys is every now and then take time to have real time interactions with other human beings face to face if you can, but use your phone as a phone and have a real time conversation with somebody instead of sending them texts and messages. That's, there's a lot of value. I mean, obviously I'm suggesting people you care about uh, and that you hope care about you connect in that way now and then it's really important for your emotional health. Okay. That's message one. Now I'm going to flip this on the other side. And I'm going to say, you know, some of us feel a lot of social anxiety and we, we would want other people to like us and we wish and we're worried they won't like us and we wish we knew some ways that we could make somebody like us. Well, here's a powerful way. Um, so often when we talk to somebody else, we and the other person are expressing our opinions. Well, I think this, but this. Oh, yeah, well, I when, when I was over here, we did that, and that suggests whatever. Oh, you were over there, I was over here. So we're always taking the other person's thing, and we're adding our own self to it. Um, that's the normal way we we 
have interactions. And so everybody's talking, nobody's listening. This is especially bad when there's arguments going on. Okay, but even when it's not arguments, just notice when you have interactions, that's how it tends to go. But in this advice, I realize I'm, I'm specifically asked, talking to people about how to deal with arguments um, and do this, but this isn't even really arguments. This is more general than that. Everybody wants to be heard. They want, especially in a case of a, a dispute or an argument, but anytime, people love to be heard and they love when people listen to them. The best thing you can do to make somebody else like you um, or, you know, to calm any situation is to stop talking and start listening. In fact, a very specific kind of listening called active listening. I, I, I will say here, this is in the case of arguing. So like in the case of an arguing, if you stop talking and you say, go ahead, let me, let me know what's really upsetting you. And the person tells you, and then if you tell them back, okay, here's what I just heard you say, that will tell that person you listened. Um, and you took the time to listen and to care. Um, and then they will be more likely to let you express your perspective. So that's in the case of arguing, but let me go more general. These are key active listening skills. And try this sometimes with a friend of yours to say, I'm going to go in, I'm going to practice my active listening. And the idea is here, sometimes I say the first starting point is almost to think like a reporter thinks, right? When a reporter is interviewing somebody, it's not about the reporter. It's about that other person and the story they have. So the next time you have a friend start to tell you some sort of story, that seems important to them. Step one, pay attention. Put your phone down. Listen to the person. Um, as they're telling the story, whoops, if they say anything that sounds a little strange or anything you're like, you did what? Um, try to withhold judgment because when you start judging somebody, they stop talking, right? But if you can just withhold judgment and say, okay, maybe we want to come back to that, but go on, let me hear your story. L seem like you're listening, like reflect on what you're hearing. Every now and then ask for more information, not to express your point of view, but to learn more about that other person's point of view. And then here's that, that part at the end, summarize. You know, here's what I heard you say. Um, and then share your reactions to that. If you can get good at doing this, people will like you. People love good listeners. It has to be authentic. You know, you have to really care. So you have to get good at actually listening and, and you know, showing that you're listening and doing these sorts of skills. But this is so important. If you learn this skill, um, it's, it's one that will do you well all through your life. Um, so I want to mention that active listening skill. Great thing to do for friends. Um, friends love it. Okay. Couple other really quickies um, on the way out. Um, we've been talking about body language throughout, and there's a really cool area of psychology. Um, some of you may have known of the of the show called Lie to Me, and the show about called Lie to Me has this character who's a psychologist who learned how to read what are called micro expressions, these little facial expressions that define certain emotional states. And they're sometimes very fleeting across a person's face, but this guy could theoretically read them. He had trained himself to read those cues and he could use them to tell when people were lying and such. So it's called lie to me. The character is based on a real psychologist named Paul Ekman. Paul Ekman did a lot of studies on emotional expression in faces. And again, the notion is while you can lie with your words, that's your frontal lobes, it's much harder to lie with your face. That's your unconscious emotional side that controls that. And that's harder to consciously control. And so if you can read somebody's face, especially the really fleeting expressions, you can get at the truth. That's the claim. I just thought this is something you guys might find fascinating related to language. So I'm going to mention, you can look online, Paul Ekman Group, find out a whole lot more about Paul's research. Um, and it's a really cool facet that shows you the power of nonverbal communication. Okay, is that it? Or is there one more? One more. 
Right. This is just another thing that I thought some of you might be interested in. So one of the things I'm continually impressed with in terms of um, the, the students at UTSC is how how many of you are multilingual, how many of you are capable of learning in a language other than your mother tongue. I, I just have to say, I think that's really impressive. Um, I can speak one language and even that, I don't know how well. <laughs> so um, I'm very impressed that you could even learn in another language and that many of you speak three or more languages, which is just, you know, mind boggling. So I thought, you know, given how common it is to be bi or multilingual at UT Scarborough, you might be interested in some of these studies that actually suggest that um, when you are fluent in multiple languages, you actually seem to perceive the world differently. Your language abilities somehow define your what you're able to see, um, which is a really interesting kind of thing. So if any of you guys are interested in that, check out, again, Google Scholar, something like that, looking at um, how bilinguals might perceive the world differently. Okay. Cool. Just some tidbits to get you thinking about language in different ways along the way. Um, I will see you again in the next lecture. Okay. Bye-bye.